All right. Uh, one by one, thank you guys so much for making time for us and making the trip uh, down here for us today. We appreciate it very much. Can you guys give them one more round of applause as a big thank you to them? Okay, so the last thing we're going to do today is we've carved out some time to do a little bit of a Q&A session with you guys. And I was overwhelmed by A, the number of questions you guys had, and B, the quality of questions. Um, you guys are awesome, and you're thinking about some really important stuff. And so what I did was, while you guys are bowling, tried to kind of lump things together in some categories. We don't have time to answer every question, so if one of yours gets skipped over, apologies ahead of time. But uh, myself and Michael and then Adam England. Adam, can you raise your hand? Uh, was coming to us from the West Side Church of Christ in Bakersfield are going to take turns kind of answering some of these questions and uh, in as kind of brief and practical a way as, as possible to give you guys some, some stuff to take home that might be useful for you. So I'm going to kick us off with a question that makes me very happy. Uh, I love that this question was even asked. And the question is, how should I stay consistent in reading the Bible every day. And I love that you guys are thinking about doing that. So number one, spiritual discipline is exactly that. It's a discipline. It has to be purposeful and you guys have got to carve out time to do it. But how do you start that kind of thing? So let me just be really practical here for you uh, as we start this. So here's my recommendation to you. Number one, take out your phone. If you've got your phone, if you've got a smartphone and it has uh, internet access, if your parents haven't cut that off from you yet and you're still able to do that, take your phone out. Open up your web browser, and at the top, type in BibleProject.com. BibleProject.com. How many of you are familiar with the Bible Project? Anybody used that before? Okay. If you're not, I want to introduce you to a resource that's been useful to me. Uh, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. But you guys live in the golden age of biblical resources, and so I want to show you one thing that might be practically useful for you. So BibleProject.com. Okay. Put your hand in the air if you're there yet, if you've got the website opened up, so I can see. Okay, once you're there, the top right, okay, you've got your menu bar. Click on that to drop down the menu. First thing says watch. Second thing says resources. So click on resources. And then you get a list that says articles, podcasts, guides. Next is reading plans. Click on reading plans. And this is what I want to show you. The Bible Project has some really neat reading plans that you can subscribe to and they walk you through. They're as short as seven days, and they're as long as a year long. So if you want a specific theme, for example, the first one that shows up on this list, list seven days, what gives you hope? And it'll be a seven-day reading plan focusing your mind on the concept of hope in Scripture. But there's also read through the Old Testament in a year, read through the New Testament in a year, read through the whole Bible in a year. Such good stuff here. And the other thing Bible Project is famous for is actually their videos. And if you guys aren't familiar with those, they're topical, they go through introductions to different aspects of, of the Bible, to different books of the Bible. Please bookmark this, save it, use it to your advantage. So that's my first recommendation, is use a resource like this to help you get in the habit of doing this every day. The second piece of advice is to figure out your schedule and a time in your day that works. If you're a morning person, do it in the morning. If you're one of those people that's scrambling to get to wherever you have to go, like school in the morning and you don't have any time, figure out another time. But find a time in the day where you can be consistent in your time you spend with your God. And then the third thing I'll say briefly is this. This has worked for me, and I'll recommend it to you. One of the things I love to do personally is I love to pray through the Psalms on a daily basis. And so I start with Psalm 1. And if I'm going to start this tomorrow, tomorrow I will start with the first psalm. I'll read Psalm 1, and then I'll use that psalm to kind of help set my mind for what I want to pray about that day. The psalms are, in a way, prayers. And so when you connect with whoever it is that authored the particular psalm that you're reading, it helps you communicate to your God. And so those are just some practical recommendations I have for you guys. Find a resource like the Bible Project Pick a time of day and stick to it. And number three, if you're struggling for a place to start, start with the Psalms. Start tomorrow. Wake up in the morning, read the first Psalm, think about what it's saying, and then pray based on what you're feeling based on that Psalm that you read. All right, so that's my recommendation for you. So I'm going to turn it over to Adam here. He's going to tackle our next one.
Yeah, I'll, I'll echo what Jason said real quick before I go into my question, just because uh, I've got friends that we do challenges, so right now we're doing hard January, and there's 31 days, so we're reading a chapter of Proverbs every single day as, as we go through the month, and then we talk about it, and we do different Bible plans together, and so yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, my question is, why does Satan attack so hard, and how do you say no to Satan if you can feel him winning? Okay, uh, so I wanted to share a couple of passages with you guys. I think sometimes, A, we forget about Satan, that Satan is present, that Satan is active, that Satan is doing things, um, and how Satan interacts with our lives, right? Uh, so the first one I want to share with you guys comes from actually Revelation, which is not something that I normally go into, um, but there's some very interesting depictions of Satan uh, and some things that we can pick up about Satan, even though it's a, an apocalyptic work. Okay, and so I want to read this to you guys from, comes from Revelation uh, chapter 12, and I'm going to start in verse 10. Uh, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser and our brothers and sisters uh, who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Uh, they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Um, we forget that Satan was cast down out of the presence of God as a fallen angel, and that Satan is awaiting a judgment that is inevitable. Satan knows what is coming for him. Uh, and so Satan struggles with the fact that he has this damnation that's coming and ultimately is trying to get other people to experience the same fate as him. Um, if, if you think about it like this, I, I don't know if you've ever had uh, those people that are in your class that will do something wrong, and they will take the whole class down with them if they can, the, the old saboteurs. Um, that's what Satan is. Satan is a saboteur of your life, and he is looking to find ways to trip you up. Um, in fact, the thing about hell that I think we forget a lot of times comes from Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, and it says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, a lot of times people ask about hell and they'll say, why is there a hell? Well, hell was not created for you and me. It was created for Satan because of the things that Satan did. And so we've got to remember that, that hell is a place that was in, initially intended for Satan. And ultimately now Satan's trying to get all those people that he can to follow him and join him in that punishment. And so, I mean, Satan's the worst, guys. Satan is the father of lies. Satan is someone who is constantly out there like a roaming lion trying to seek those that he may devour. And so uh, that comes from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 9, which says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We all experience that temptation from Satan, where Satan is trying to trip us up and trying to get us to believe the lies that he is spinning, okay? Um, and, and I want to point this out to you guys real quick uh, before we go any further. It, it talks about, in that verse, eight about being of sober mind. When we talk about, you know, how do you say no to Satan if you can feel him winning, the best thing that you can do, and it goes back to what Jason was talking about with spiritual disciplines, is that you can be in God's word. When we see Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, the way that Jesus responded to the temptations and the lies of Satan were to remind Satan what God had said. Because God is the one who gives us the truth, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When we know the words of Jesus... We're able to resist Satan and continue to walk the way that we're supposed to walk. And so finding ways to continue to dwell in God's word as much as you can. And guys, it doesn't have to be this big mountaintop moment like what we have at camp or, or when you have this big spiritual revelation. The daily dose, the regular just digestion of God's word will help fortify you to overcome the temptations that Satan brings into your lives. Okay? All right, Michael, you ready?
All right, so I have a trio of questions uh, that all kind of relate, so I'm going to do my best to answer these questions together. Uh, but just so you guys know, the, one of, the first question is, how can I use my faith to help others who are stuck between godly things and worldly things? The second, what if someone I'm friends with doesn't believe slash like God? And the third question, how can you share God's word with atheists? It's a great question, great set of questions, right? Um, a lot of the times we, we hear those questions, um, it comes from students, comes from adults who've been uh, in their faith for a long time, and the reality of the situation is it's really hard to get people to listen to you that don't like what you're saying. So instead, what do we do? You know, there's a couple of approaches. You can try to broach the topic with them. You can try to bring up scripture. You could just throw scripture into your daily life. Like what Adam was saying, when you know the scriptures, you're able to use them as, as basically a sword, right? When you go into battle, this is what uh, Paul talks about in Ephesians when he talks about uh, the sword of the spirit, right? It's, it's that whole idea, but more so than anything, I think our best way to reach people who aren't open to Christianity, who aren't open to hearing the scriptures, I think is the, it's to live our lives like Christ. To live our life in a way that is different from the world, that allows people to look at us and go, what is it about, I'll use myself as an example, what is it about Michael? Why, why does he live that way? Why doesn't he do X or why does he do Y? Sometimes when you have those people in your life, it's really hard to just sit there and go, well, you know, in Scripture it says this. But we learn a lot from Scripture. The lessons that we learn and those things that we've learned, you don't have to necessarily know book, chapter, and verse, but you can implement those same ideas into your conversations. One of the things that I'm reminded of comes from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 12. Here's what it says. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received it. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to obtain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So what's the idea here? How do we talk to people who aren't open to that conversation? How do we talk to our friends who don't believe in God? Do we have to hit them over the head with the Bible and say, read it, you dummy? No, maybe sometimes we'd like to, but we need to show them the love of Christ. We need to live in step with the Spirit. You might know where I'm going next, but Galatians chapter 5 talks about what the fruit of the Spirit is. And if you live in step with the Spirit, not only you, but other people will be able to see these things in you. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, right? It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So how do we have those conversations? Let's let our actions speak louder than our words. The things that we choose to say and not say, those are the things that people are watching. There's always eyes watching. So my encouragement to you is to try to live in step with the Spirit, to try to live more like Christ each and every day. Does it mean you're always going to get it right? No. But help people start to process what it looks like to be a Christian, and eventually they'll start asking the question, well, what does it mean to look more like Christ? Okay, uh, so the last question that I have, uh, it, it says, when you are deciding your career in life, how will you eventually determine if it aligns with God's will? 
I really appreciate this question. Um, for me, the, the, the way that I think about career and, and really the way this world works, uh, me becoming a minister was a really long journey. I didn't, I didn't start off wanting to be a minister. Uh, in fact, I, I kind of felt like Jonah for a long time where I was just like running the other direction. Uh, I have an undergraduate degree in marketing. I worked as a corporate trainer for a Fortune 500 company, and then I went to law school. And ultimately, I left law school to go into ministry um, because I didn't like who I was becoming. Uh, I can tell you guys now, um, it does not matter what you do. There, there are people that are amazing Christian lawyers, um, but you have to figure out where is God calling you to be and be present in that calling. Uh, for me, I felt like I was running from something, and, and ultimately, when I finally felt like I was hearing God's voice clearly, uh, there was a peace that came over me, and I could begin to see God working in my life more clearly. Um, the, the crazy thing is, is that every single one of you have talents of some sort. Um, I mean, just look at one by one, right? Like, you've got this amazing team that works together and shares a talent, and all of them individually are talented, and they do a lot of cool things, but they're using that talent to bring glory to God. And no matter what you do, and, and, and you can be anything, you can be a doctor, you can be a garbage person, you, you can do any job, but how that job brings glory to God is really the bigger question. And are you putting yourself in position to bring glory to God? You will have so many opportunities and especially the meetings that you have with counselors when you sit there and they're showing you all the options of colleges and all the different career paths that you could take. Ask yourself this question, how am I going to glorify God in what I do? Uh, I want to share this with you. It comes from, Proverbs, or from Psalm 37. It says, verse 7, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. I can tell you this, the worst decisions I have made have been decisions that I've made quickly and of my own wisdom. Uh, the best thing you can do is if you are not sure, are you willing to wait? Because this world is a world of hurry. And they'll tell you, you have to do something quickly. Um, quick plug about an organization that I have a lot of love for. There's this group called AIM, which is Adventures and Missions. It's based out of Lubbock, Texas, and it's designed for those who graduate high school to take two years and go get trained in missions and then go work in a mission field. And so there's a lot of people that come out of high school and they're not ready to make that decision for college. Maybe you don't want to tack on, you know, however much debt it is for a year of schooling. Um, I mean, I know for me, when I went to school, it was like $25,000 a year, and I just heard what uh, Pepperdine's charging per year, and it made me like sick. Like, I was like, ugh. <laughs> now, if Jeff Walling was here, he would tell you about all the great scholarships that exist for Church of Christ students, but that's beside the point. If you're not sure what your next decision's gonna be, are you willing to wait and hear God rather than to hear your fears speak, which as I was talking about earlier, your fears are the ways that God or that Satan manipulates you into the wrong decisions. I can tell you now there's lots of people who made decisions based on how much money they would make and they ended up miserable and not close to God at all. It's not about how much money you make. It's not about, you know, putting yourself in a position of power. What can you do to bring glory and honor to God? Uh, and so I want to read this to you. This is from James chapter 4. It says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Um, I can tell you now, when, when I was graduating high school, I heard of all the schools that my friends were going to, and there's this thing, there was college envy. I don't know, do we have any upperclassmen in here that are like getting close to graduating? Okay. Uh, there was something about listing what school you were going to go to, and like some people, like they didn't want to mention they were going to like a community college or if they were going to go to this university or that university. If it's bringing you boasting, if that's the reason you're doing it, 
so you can brag about what you do, it's probably a sign it's, it's not the right thing, right? And for me, guys, I can say this for me, being a lawyer was 100% about bragging. Like, I knew what came with that title, and that's why I was more interested in it. Um, it says, if anyone then knows the good thing they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Which is interesting to me because James doesn't say, hey, um, if you eat meat, that's a sin. No, he's saying if you know what's right and you don't do that thing, then that is sin. And so there's caution in there for us. I think sometimes we need to slow down. We need to turn off our fear and we need to listen to God and hear what God is calling on your life. Again, you will see the fruit that God produces when you're walking with God rather than walking of your own wisdom. All right. Thanks, guys. One thing I just want to add to what Adam said, too. Um, spending 20-plus years in local churches now, many of whom uh, are in parts of the country where losing membership, struggling, needing people to really, you know, do kingdom work. People get the mindset that you're either in ministry or you just go to church. Uh, what they don't realize is how valuable you are, regardless of what space you occupy in a local church, if you just put the kingdom first. I can remember working for little churches in Wisconsin, and the most exciting thing in the world was when a Christian family would move to town and join the church because you've got people that are ready to work and to labor. And so keep in mind on top of when you're thinking about what you're going to do, think about where you're going to do it and where the local church is in those areas and how you can get involved and what the kingdom's doing in those places because I promise uh, those churches will be very excited to have you guys work alongside them. Okay, a couple questions and then we're going to wrap up for today. This one... Um, Hard for me to even read because I can remember asking these questions. And there were several that were along the same line, and I just picked one because I think it's representative of kind of the heart behind the question. And it's several questions in one, but I'm just going to read it. Will I be good enough for him? Will he be mad? Does he actually love me? Am I worth it? Am I worth it? So when you guys wrestle with questions of value and self-worth, Two things. Number one, 1 Corinthians 6, one of the passages I used in my lesson. Do you remember what Paul said? He said, you are not your own because you have been, anybody remember? You've been bought with a price. What was the price paid for you? It was Christ. When God gives his son in exchange for you, you don't have to question your value in the eyes of your creator. How much does God love you? He loves you so much that he gave the most valuable thing in exchange for your affection. That's a love without end. Guys, please don't ever question your value in the eyes of your creator. I know what it's like to be a teenager and to struggle with self-doubt and to ask big questions and you might feel like you're not as valuable in the eyes of your friend group as you'd like to be. And you might be wondering how you fit in. And you might not have the relationship with your parents that you'd like to have at this moment in time. But please don't ever doubt the amount of love that your God has for you. You are worth everything to him. Everything. The second thing I want to point out is this. And do me a favor, okay? If you have something to write on, write this down. If you've got a Bible app and you have the ability to like digital, hi, digitally highlight, do that. If you've got your physical Bible with you and you like to underline, do that. I just want to give you guys, again, something practical. I want to give you a couple passages that you can use to spend time in. And I mean it, spend real time in these passages. We talk about Bible reading a lot, as if you just read it, instantly you know everything there is to know and you can close your Bible and walk away. But it takes real meditation sometimes, some intentional time spent wrestling with scripture and the deep meanings behind scripture, I want to give you a couple passages that are worth wrestling with, okay? It starts in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and following. I want you to listen to what God is communicating to us about his love for us and our value in his eyes. It says, you see, at the right 
time when you were still powerless. Think about these words, okay? When you were, number one, powerless, Christ died for the, number two, ungodly. Powerless and ungodly, Christ still died for us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still, what's the word? Sinners. Christ died for us. Christ died for us while we were powerless, ungodly, and sinners. Do you see the love of God made manifest in the death of Jesus? Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were, here's the last word, God's what? Enemies. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been now reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but also we boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. If you've got it in your mind that God only loves you once you've proven to him that you are worth his love, please erase that notion from your mind. What is he telling us here? That he showed his love for us by sending his son to die when we were powerless, ungodly, sinners, and even enemies of him. That's when he died for us. If you're asking, how do I know if I'm good enough for him? The answer is you're not, and you never will be. That's not what God's love is about. You don't earn the love of your creator. God is love. Number two, Romans chapter 7. We're going to stick in Romans for just a minute here. Romans chapter 7 is this struggle, and people argue about whether this is Paul speaking from a personal place or not. I think he is. But he's talking about what it's like to try to pursue a relationship with God based on your own good behavior. If you think, okay, if I just keep God's law perfectly, then I can stand justified before him. If I can do everything good enough, then I'll earn the right to be loved by God. What's going to happen every time? You're going to fall short. And you're going to get yourself in this endless cycle of guilt that you can never get out of because you're never going to live up to the expectations set forth in God's law. So where does that leave us? Well, Paul asks this question. Uh, He says, uh, wretched man that I am, in verse 24, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to highlight that, underline that. Then I want you to draw an arrow that connects it to chapter 8 in verse 1. Because listen to what he says next. He says, therefore, there is now, you guys paying attention? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We spend so much of our lives afraid of the condemnation of our God when if we are in Christ, condemnation is not a thing that we have to live under. The fear of that is not something that needs to to hang over us all the time. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of of sin and death. I hope you will spend a lot of time in Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite chapters in Scripture. You want to be encouraged? You want to be reminded of the power of God's love? Spend time in Romans chapter 8. But let me, let me end with this on this question. If you skip down in Romans chapter 8, let's, let's go to verse 26. Let me just read the, the last part of this chapter to you, okay? In the same way the Spirit helps us in our, what's the word? Weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then you skip down to verse 31, and this is what he says. What then shall we say in response to all these things? I can remember vividly, Third grade, we had an art project. And I don't remember what the project was, but I remember working on it for a week with my mom. And I drew a picture of the globe, and I did my best coloring job in third grade, and I wrote in big letters over the top, if God is for us, who can be against us? I did not understand the full weight of that. I just knew even in third grade, 
that that's the kind of God I want to serve. I want to know that, that if God is for me, no one can be against me. And that's what Paul is telling us here. If God is for us, who can be against us? Listen, guys, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who's left then to condemn? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How much does God love you? With a love so deep that nothing on this earth can separate you from the love of God that exists in Christ Jesus. Will you guys do me a favor? Will you spend some time in Romans chapter 8, please? Remind yourself of these truths. Lay your anxiety at the feet of the God who loves you and give over to his love. Okay, one last question then, and it's, uh, it's this one. We'll wrap up with this one. It says, maybe some of you guys can relate to this too. I, I remember vividly wrestling with this question. Many of my friends have already been baptized, but I haven't. And I'm wondering if it will affect my life with Christ. How do I know if I'm ready to be baptized? Okay, go back to Romans chapter 6. Sandwiched in the middle of everything we just looked at. Romans chapter 6. If you guys are thinking about baptism, you're wondering about baptism, Romans chapter 6 is a good place to spend some time. So after he convinces us in Romans chapter 5 that Christ died for us, Even when we were all those things we talked about, helpless, powerless, sinners, enemies. He asked this question at the end of Romans chapter 5 about sin and its relationship to grace. And here's the thing. Because God loves us so much, does that give us permission then to do whatever we want because we can always just rely on God's grace? Or the way Paul puts it in Romans chapter 6, he says, so what shall we say then? Shall we continue sinning so that God's grace can increase. And his answer to that is, may it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So here's my answer to the first part of that question. I'm wondering if it will affect my life with Christ. Here's my answer. Life with Christ begins at baptism. You might have a life of interest in Christ, but life in Christ begins at baptism. At baptism, you join Christ in his death and his resurrection so that you have what? What does Paul say? Newness of life. So if you're asking yourself, how important is baptism? What does it have to do with my relationship with God in Christ? It begins at baptism. It is the new birth. It's when life begins all over again. And now you are his entirely. But the second part of the question, how do I know I'm ready? Well, I'll do my best with that one. And all I can say is, I'm just going to tell you a story, okay? I was baptized when I was 17. I grew up in the church. I grew up around the same situation, watched kids get baptized when they were 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. All my friends were baptized, and I just wrestled with it all the time. And I'll be honest with you, the thing I wrestled with the most is, what if I'm baptized today and I screw up tomorrow? Then what? I had this idea in my head that I had to wait until I was perfect, until I began my life in Christ. Well, I'd still be waiting today, wouldn't I, if I waited for that, right? But here's the thing, here's what happened. I was a junior in high school. I was dating a girl who was a senior in high school. She invited me to go to her youth group at a church in town. And we got into a Bible study one night. And you got to understand where I was at 17 years old. 
my approach towards telling people about my faith was, um, what's the word, aggressive? You would call me, um, let me think of a technical term, uh, butthead, I think would probably be a pretty good description, right? I just like to argue with people, right? That was like my mode of evangelism, just argue all the time with people as if I knew anything. But I can remember arguing with her and showing her, look, look at what the Bible says. You have got to be baptized. What are you waiting for? And I can remember she got so frustrated with me one night and she finally, she's like, well, when were you baptized? I was like, well, actually, <laughs> haven't done that yet. And I went home and man, I, I was up the whole night wrestling with that. And I can remember my preacher had told me, I remember him telling me, even if you want to be baptized in the middle of the night, you call me and tell me. So I called my preacher at 2.30 in the morning on a Saturday night. He was real excited to hear from me at 2.30 in the morning, right? But he got the baptism, baptismal ready the next Sunday morning, got baptized in freezing cold water in Wisconsin in March. I can remember it. Um, but I'm just telling you, I know what it's like to wrestle with that question. And, and here's the answer to the question. How do you know when you're ready? It has everything to do with what we started talking about with Michael's lesson today. First of all, do you believe? Do you believe? Are you convicted thoroughly in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died according to the Scriptures, and that he was raised three days later according to the Scriptures? If you believe in that, that's the first question to answer. Are you convicted of that reality? But the second question to ask yourself is this. Am I ready to follow him? Am I ready to follow him? Because discipleship looks a lot different than the way the world sets it up sometimes. Even within our own churches sometimes, we get so used to um, a lazy approach towards discipleship. We reduce discipleship down to, as long as I go to church one hour a week, I'm good to go. And only that if it works out. Are you ready to put everything in your life on hold and devote yourself entirely to the path that Christ has laid out before you. If you're ready to do that, if you believe in Jesus with all your heart, and you're ready to follow him with all your life, then you're ready to put him on in baptism. You're not waiting for perfection. You're not waiting until a point in time where you're not going to sin again as long as you live. This is the first step into faith. Are you ready to put your confidence and trust in him, and are you ready to follow him if so, then the answer is, you're ready. And I will remind you of what uh, Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, as they were traveling through the desert, were studying about Jesus, the Ethiopian eunuch found some water and he said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? If you believe with all your heart, you may. This is not an invitation here, guys, okay? I'm not going to... I'm not a fan of, of talking young people into doing anything, but I do want to let you know that if you've been holding back when you really are ready, don't wait anymore. Make the decision to put him on. Okay? Talk to your parents, talk to your minister, talk to your youth minister, find a family in church that you, that you love and you know love you back. Have a conversation with them, have a study with them, and talk about this. Okay? If this day today is a catalyst that God was working on your heart to make you think more critically about that, then I hope you'll do something about that as you leave here today. Listen, guys, I'm so impressed with you, with your attitudes today. I've had some conversations with you guys. You've encouraged me. I hope we've encouraged you. I, um, I love the questions that you're asking. Keep asking those questions uh, and never stop seeking out knowledge of your God. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael, and uh, we're going to wrap up for the day. Thank you, guys. Alrighty. Well, we'll wrap up here quickly. A uh, couple of things I want to say first. Uh, I want to say thank you to Jason. Thank you to Adam. Thank you to all of our volunteers uh, in the back who've helped throughout the day. Let's give them all a round of applause for all the work that they put in. Uh, keep clapping. I want to thank you guys for coming here, uh, spending your Saturday here with us. You guys deserve a round of applause. Uh, I want to thank one by one for taking uh, part of their Saturday or all of their Saturday to be here. And uh, I just want to leave you with this. Um, as we close out today, 
just a short passage from Hebrews chapter 10 uh, as we close out this discussion on our faith. So Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, And having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. With that, you guys are dismissed. Thank you so much for being with us here at Recharge 2024. Get home safe.